Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Jesse Fisher. I'm the Executive Director of Preservation Buffalo Niagara. Uh, some of you uh, probably are familiar with us, hopefully. Um, uh, as you can see, we're just going to keep everyone muted and um, keep your camera off if you prefer. Um, but I do want to let everyone know that uh, we will be live streaming this to YouTube. Some folks will be watching on YouTube and it will be available on our YouTube channel to watch later so for folks who had a conflict and couldn't make it tonight um, or want to watch it later. So if you're not comfortable, just make sure that you have your um, your camera off. We are recording um, this session. So with that, um, thanks everyone so much for joining us. Um, we're really excited to bring you tonight's program and we hope that we can all learn something together. Um, before we actually get started on the main program. Oh, Tia, can we just run through and make sure everyone's muted? It'll just be a little easier that way. Um, I do wanna just go over some ground rules. Um, we really strive at PBN, as I think everyone knows, to create um, a place for dialogue and meaning, and we want it to be a friendly, safe, and respectable, respectful environment. So make sure that as you're asking questions or engaging with us or with the speakers or with each other, that we keep everything in that spirit um, of respect and, um, and openness. We want everyone to have a positive experience. And if the rules are violated, then we really won't allow you to register for future PBN events or programs. We think it's very important um, to create um, a safe space where everyone um, can feel comfortable. So um, we will be taking questions tonight, um, but we're going to do it through the chat. So um, for those of you who may not be familiar, if you take your cursor and you um, hover over your screen, kind of move it around, you should see a little box down at the bottom that says chat. Feel free to type question in there at any point that it might strike you throughout the evening. And Tia and I are going to monitor the chat throughout the program, and we'll make sure um, we leave time for question and answer at the end. So if you have a question for me or for Christy or for Jody, we'll make sure we get to those. Um, so you can throw them in the chat at any time and we are paying attention to it um, and we will get to it um, at the appropriate time. Um, before we actually get to our panelists, I did just want to um, take a minute and just give you some background on PBN's ongoing journey that has brought us to this spot tonight. As some of you may know, PBN was actually created um, from the merging of two organizations back in 2009. Um, and these organizations, the Landmark Society of the Niagara Frontier and the Preservation Coalition have been active since um, the 1960s and 1970s. And so they've done some really amazing uh, work in the community um, to protect some of our most iconic buildings and neighborhoods. And we're really grateful for what they've done. We truly do stand on the shoulders of giants uh, here at PBN. But at some point, preservation became kind of stuck, if you will. And if you read the landscape of what's important through what we've actually protected, um, you come away with the impression of a city being built mostly by and for uh, white straight men. Um, and you really get a sense mostly of architecture that celebrates power and privilege. And of course, this is part of the story, um, but it's not the whole story. And so for the last few years, we've really been working hard to make sure that preservation efforts in our region are telling the full story and that the place is important to everyone are protected. And you've seen examples of that in our work to protect Willard Park Courts, our Gay Places with Dr. Jeff series, our work to save the Eliza Quirk House. These are all examples of trying to make sure that we're going beyond the boundaries of simply those um, you know, those really beautiful places that we love, but that don't tell the whole story of our entire community. Um, and tonight we're going to focus on our ongoing and very imperfect work to acknowledge that Buffalo's history did not start in 1792 when Dutch investors purchased over 3 million acres of land in what we now call Western New York. Prior to 1792, the city of Buffalo was home to the thriving culture of the people of the Six Nations, the Haudenosaunee. And while not always acknowledged, the Haudenosaunee culture is a living culture and is still thriving here in Western New York. And the symbols and development patterns of that culture can still be found all over our region. And perhaps nowhere um, as visibly and as 
in our own beloved city hall. And those of you who know PBN know that we consider ourselves of having kind of a special relationship with City Hall. In pre-pandemic life, we did a free tour every noon, every weekday at noon, which I'm sure a lot of you have been on. And as we have come to really uh, dig into and listen to our own tour, uh, we've started to notice that, that um, how we were portraying the symbolism um, of that building wasn't always living up to what we consider to be our ethical standard here at PBN and even our intellectual standard. And I'm gonna let Christiana talk a little bit more about that at the moment, but this really came to a head as we started updating our city hall book. And some of you may know that we and may even have the original 1993 version of Buffalo City Hall American Ask Masterpiece. And um, while we're very proud of that book and we know that a lot of people um, have uh, really enjoyed owning that. And actually all started because we were running low on copies and we knew that more people wanted it. So a couple of years ago, thanks to a very generous grant from the Bauer Family Foundation, we started on a journey to update that book. Um, and uh, with the Bauer Family Foundation support and assistance, um, we have been able to include all new beautiful color photography in that book um, and really uh, a lot more historic images and all kinds of things. But as we were reading through it, um, we became, uh, we noticed some discrepancies again in how the building portrayed our indigenous symbolism in the region. And so we really wanted to address that. And so um, we reached out to scholar Jody Lynn Maracle to ask her assistance uh, in updating the book. And that's kind of how we came here tonight. So I'm gonna turn the conversation over to Christiana Lehavis first before we get to Jody. And I'm sure most of you know Christy at this point, she's our director of preservation services. Um, and she really oversaw uh, the efforts to get this book out to you. Um, she has 15 years of experience in historic preservation. Originally from Albany, New York, Christiana completed her coursework towards her MA in Historic Preservation Planning at Cornell University and has worked in nonprofit advocacy and consulting in Louisiana, Texas, and New York. When not in her soapbox preaching the gospel of preservation, Christy enjoys watching endless marathons of law and order, visiting presidential grave sites, and reading cheesy historical fiction. And Buffalo was very lucky the day she accepted our job offer and came here to PBN. So Christy, I'm gonna mute myself and turn this over to you to talk more about <laughs> Thank you so much. When um, you had asked me, should I just read your bio from the website? And I said, yes, I forgot that it included the goofy things at the end of it. So thank you very much for keeping those in. Uh, yes, I do love- PBN love loves our goofy factoids about <laughs> our staff. <laughs> Thanks. Oh man. All right. So Tonight, you know, before we get into the nitty gritty conversations about our complicated relationship we have, we can have with a place. Let's make sure we're all on the same page about the place in question tonight. Um, so let's go over some basic facts about our, our beloved city hall and the architectural styles and elements that are present there. So Buffalo City Hall was built 1929 to 1931. And it was a team of three architects who worked on this project. First was John J. Wade, who is the principal designer of the building. He is this guy right here on the left-hand side. There was George J. Didel, um, who is in the middle there. He's a local architect who partnered with Wade for this project. Um, and then for a few years after the building was completed and then rounding out the team was Sullivan W. Jones, a former state architect for New York State who resigned just before the City Hall was done. Um, and he was also a mentor to John J. Wade. So he kind of created, gave that kind of weight and experience to this team of architects working on this building. And the style that this building is in is Art Deco. Um, what is Art Deco about this building? Well, first of well, Art Deco is about being bold and futuristic. It's about abandoning the old ways of architecture, not relying so heavily on those classical elements that previous generations and styles of architecture relied on. And it was just a new way of thinking for this modern era that we were encountering. 
So what are those characteristics that we see on Art Deco buildings? We see smooth wall surfaces. We see sharp edged linear appearances, not, you know, there's Art Modern just a little bit later that loves that curve and slope, but um, Art Deco likes sharp lines. Um, and with that love of sharp line that comes with uh, using geometric patterns. So you're gonna see lots of zigzags and chevrons and other motifs. Uh, there is an emphasis on the vertical. Obviously, we see Art Deco the most in skyscrapers and large public buildings, so there usually is an actual tower, a part of that building, but you're also going to see other vertical projections and emphasis on the, on the vertical. And we see that here by the setbacks that City Hall has, so we have setbacks within the mass of the building, again emphasizing that central tower. And then within the design, we have these vertical projections. So design elements that emphasize that verticality of the building. And then in those geometric patterns and decorative elements that are included in that structure, you're gonna see a lot of emphasis on low relief decorative, decorative panels. So sculpture work, but low relief, not necessarily huge freestanding architect, you know, statues or things of that nature. Where did Art Deco come from? Um, there is a lot of things that happen at the turn of the century in the 1900s and 19 teens that collectively create and allow for what we now define as Art Deco. Um, its name is a derived from and shortened is a short version of Art Decorative. And we get that name from the 1925 exposition Internationale des Arts Decoratives and Industrial Moderne which is a horrible pronunciation of that title. My high school French teacher would be very angry with me. Um, it, again, it was all about celebrating this new era of modern design. And so we get the name from that exposition. Um, but really, if we kind of rewind it a couple of years, uh, the first real example that we now can identify as being Art Deco is gonna be in 1922 with that center drawing, which is, um, a drawing, uh, so Chicago Tribune, the newspaper had a contest to design their new headquarters. And so this image in the center uh, didn't win the contest, but it was second place. Um, and uh, it was designed by Errol, er, Eliel Sarin, who is the father of the father and son Sarin duo who designed Buffalo's Kleinhans Theater. Um, and again, this is kind of that first major example of what we now define as Art Deco. Um, then if we think of the best example of something that was actually built, because th that drawing was just a drawing, it wasn't the actual building, um, I think the most quintessentially Art Deco building here in America as an example is going to be the Chrysler building, which is what we see on the right hand side, um, designed by William Van Allen. Van Allen's design, we see he's, a, he's abandoning some aspects of classical design, but then again also retaining those elements, but redefining them to fit within that geometric heavy emphasis of Art Deco and that modern movement that Art Deco is. So if we look at this building and it's you know not a close up, so we're just gonna look at the general aspects of it. We see these elements here on the corner of the main tower section that kind of look like gargoyles, something from traditional architecture, right? Um, but they aren't gargoyles. They're actually stylized hood ornaments of Chrysler cars. So again, taking this traditional element that is uh, found in architecture, but twisting it to be this modern version of it. What looks like conventional geometric designs or in spandrels and in flat surfaces of the wall are actually, yes, geometric designs, but they are influenced by hubcaps and fender designs as well. And then it's topped with uh, where we would normally see an elaborate cornice or some other type of traditional material or element on the top of a building. Here we see that turned into this terraced crown, right? It's utilizing that sunburst pattern, which is so very Art Deco, but also in this instance is emblematic and representative of wheels, spokes on a wheel. So again, using these, you know, common elements that are in buildings, but twisting them and, and changing them to be this modern version of them. At the same time that we have our deco forming and this push from European designers, American designers are also working on creating something new, fresh and modern, abandoning the rules of and elements of classical design, but wanting to make something decidedly American, 
We see baby steps of that with the work of H.H. Richardson and Louis Sullivan, which we have examples of here in Buffalo, but it gets kicked into overdrive with Frank Lloyd Wright and his buddies back in Chicago and what is to be known as the Prairie School. Um, so in again, trying to create something decidedly American, Frank Lloyd Wright and his contemporaries looked to incorporate what they saw as native American precedents of architecture. So we see those men, mostly men, there are a handful of women, but mostly white men, look to examples um, of Mezzo and North American indigenous design and architecture and using those and their reinterpretation of those designs as the starting point for their own work and the evolution of Art Deco in America. So that leads to the examples um, to buildings such as the examples you see on your screen right now. Top right hand is the Ennis House in uh, Los Angeles designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1923 to 24. Um, it's uh, described now as being Mayan revival. Um, so again, he wanted to evoke the feeling and decorative elements of a Mayan palace. Um, and so pulling those elements into it and trying to create a distinctively different type of house design that while relying on his interpretation of indigenous Mayan architecture and design and changing it up to be something new and different. On the left-hand side is 450 Sutter Street, which is in San Francisco, built in 1929. An art deco building with stylized Mayan designs and hieroglyphics. Again, not an accurate representation of those elements, but they looked to those examples and had those examples influence their designs to create this next version, a next generation of American art. Um, and then down here in the middle kind of bottom with the two flags flanking that entranceway is the Guardian building in Chicago built in 1928. Um, it is actually a national historic landmark and it is described today as being a blending of Native American, Aztec and arts and crafts influences. So again, here in America, we have this precedent and many examples of trying to create this American version of architecture, create an American art deco and using these interpretations and examples of indigenous art to, uh, to forward their designs, to in influence their own designs. So let's bring us back to Buffalo City Hall, right? Um, so as Jessie said in, in her introduction, a couple of years ago, we realized that our tour program was up for a refresh, that we've been going on for quite a while and we just needed to put some new life and vitality in it. Wanted to look over those scripts. Um, we have we used to have, I mean, obviously the pandemic has kind of put a, a damper on that, <laughs> but we were had a very, very um, active and, and very popular City Hall tour. In 2019, we had over 3,000 particip 3, participants on our tour, 500 of which were just school children alone coming to City Hall, coming on our other tours um, through their classes. So again, having this very popular and well-attended tour, but wanting to make sure that our scripts were fun and engaging, but accurate in that we were shaping so many, you know, having so many children and school children coming through, we want to make sure that it was the best tour and informational as possible. Uh, this also kind of coincided with my joining PBN. So by doing this refresh, I kind of saw it as a, a crash course opportunity for me to really learn every single thing about this building and get way, way better with all of that information. So it was very perfect moment to have this in-depth kind of review and audit of our tour program and specifically our city hall script. Um, so what did we do? What did what happened? We went on our tours with our docents. Uh, it's all volunteer docent tour guides that help us with these tours. We went through all of our documents and scripts and really took a deep dive into what we were telling our docents to say and then what our docents were saying. So what did we find? Uh, we realized that our script was rather dated. <laughs> um, there were examples of, uh, you know, there were examples and analogies to explain various things included in the script um, that were out of date or not relevant anymore. Uh, an example of that was that in our script and our docents, we encouraged our docents to kind of talk about the costs associated building this building and translating them and into you know today's dollars right well all of those figures that we had for today's dollars were many years old so how is that a relevant interesting fact if it's out of date so again little things like that but needing to correct it we also realized that a lot of our tour guides 
wonderful docents had been doing this tour for quite some time and were active docents at other institutions. So they were able to bring in and include a lot of facts that were not included in our script, which is great, more information for everyone. So we wanted to review the information to make sure that it is based in fact, wanted to include those. But there were also some facts that were being shared that we didn't necessarily think were entirely accurate, or maybe were more of a product of a game of telephone of historic facts. That it was originally based on things, but over the years getting told that this tour or that tour kind of gotten distorted. So we needed to do some fact checking and making sure that that is the correct information that we want to share. Um, we also realized that our scripts had inaccuracies uh, when it came to explaining some of the more complicated aspects of the building. Um, you know, the evolution and design and how Art Deco became what we call it today is a lot of factors. And so there was a lot of watering down of the history of Art Deco and the history of the city that we wanted to re reevaluate and reword so that it was positively putting forth a correct vision of history, but also was engaging for our tour guides um, and for participants. Um, but lastly, and more importantly to tonight's topic is that we realized that our script talk and our script talked about influences and the use of indigenous designs in a way that we could not confirm or that by today's standards, we felt were inappropriate ways to discuss indigenous peoples and cultures. Um, the original version of this script, which was written based on that original city hall book, again, was written in the 90s. Uh, the way that we speak and discuss indigenous peoples and their cultures is vastly different than it was in the 1990s compared to today. And certainly different than even in the 2000s or the 2010s. Uh, every year we you know, evolve and learn more and understand more about each other's cultures and we want to make sure that our terminology is evolving as well. And so we needed to freshen up and change out those terms. We realized that our script also included some problematic interpretations and inaccurate inaccurate retellings of historic events involving indigenous peoples in Western New York. Um, and so again, wanting to correct and, and update what was accurate interpretations and retellings and, and conveyances of true culture and mythology and actual indigenous, indigenous cultures and what was maybe reimagining of it or retelling it from a white point of view. We wanted to correct those things. So what are some examples of those things that we found? Um, here is an image of the rear frieze of the building. It's on the Elmwood side of City Hall. This frieze has several vignettes of important moments in Buffalo's history. And a few of those vignettes in, in, involve indigenous peoples. Um, and again, looking at our script and then the book that we got the, the script from, realizing that maybe the version of these events was more along a romanticized version and telling of those events and not an accurate telling of historical facts. Um, we don't want to perpetuate inaccuracies. We wanna speak openly and honestly about these, um, these events. And so here is, a, you, know, you see the whole freeze on your screen at the top and then that center kind of close-up image is of, um, you know, as described in the script, red jacket handing over a ceremonial tomahawk to Erastus Grange, a very famous moment that we love to talk about in Buffalo and is, has been memorialized in many murals and sculptures across the town. But again, is our script telling that, in, you know, retelling and explaining that vignette accurately to how it actually happened in history or a more romanticized version of that, um, that, uh, makes it seem a lot, uh, that just a romanticized version of that. So wanting to correct those elements. Another uh, example of where we felt that our script and the city hall book was lacking is confirming the origination and, and influence and where these indigenous inspired designs came from. And so here is a, a, a shot of the focal point in the lobby of, of city hall, um, this hexagon shape uh, with uh, what has been described as feathers coming out and, and resembling a headdress. Um, again, it's not clear in a reading of our script, in a reading of the original City Hall book, is this assessment of it being a headdress because it was relaying 
relying on ideas held by the designer of their study of actual indigenous de designs and this is their reinterpretation of it or is this something of a result of you know a hindsight a later a modern analysis by an art historian or some other professional um you know implying you know putting their vision of what this could be an inference of what this could be um when we would do our you know looking to see well where, where do we get the dis description of this being a headdress it turned into kind of a circle of, of sources citing each other so again even in looking at what was deemed academic sources there really didn't even seem in those sources to be a genuine explanation of where these designs came from and justification um, or you know explanation that this was something that derived from something um, original. Um, here is another example of where we just felt that our tour script and the city hall book and sources didn't give us enough information and we weren't sure with it. You know, this is the crowning top of our, our the tower, the beautiful polychromatic uh, terracotta tiles creating that triangle shape around the entire um, tower it's often described again as a crown or as a headdress but again is this a crown or headdress that's modeled after true examples of indigenous art and artifacts is it a designer's purposeful reimagination of true indigenous art and artifacts or is this an insensitive modern assessment based on racist and uneducated ideas of what indigenous art and artifacts look like or represent um and then lastly, and, and sort of more uh, important-ish is that there are many human and animal figures, carvings that are found in City Hall, beautiful pieces of work um, that are referred to in the script in the City Hall book as being specifically from, um, you know, myth representing either um, clan animals, um, or other aspects of religious and, um, you know, of, of culture. And so in trying to find, you know, explanations and sources of these, is this from the designers' words themselves back in the 1920s and 30s? Do we have writings from them that explain the accuracy of these? Or is this a modern day assessment of these elements? Um, and, and we even discovered that some of the carvings on the inside, uh, the interior of the building, you know, weren't actually connected to true mythology of the indigenous peoples that lived here in Western New York, but actually were inspired by poems and other retellings and reinterpretations of true uh, indigenous mythology. So again, needing to understand and resource and identify the sources and confirm those. In doing that, we realized that this was beyond our breath, that we didn't have that information and knowledge and expertise to actually properly analyze these and make sure that we're telling the stories correctly of these pieces. Um, and so that is when we realized that we needed to bring in someone to help us with that. And at that point, I will hand it off to Jesse to move on to our next portion of that. I'll stop my share. to Jesse. <laughs> Thank you. You'd think 10 months into the pandemic, I'd be really good at unmuting and muting, but I am not. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. Um, so I hope that gave you kind of a sense of, you know, where we got to and where we realized. And I think for everyone engaged in preservation, it's really important to understand what you don't know as much as what you do know. I'm super proud of the PBM staff. They're really knowledgeable expert people in a lot of ways, but we do not have all the answers. And so um, we wanted to make sure that what we were doing um, was both accurate, but also wasn't perpetuating harmful um, characterizations of people that are our neighbors um, and our friends and our members and, um, you know, who use this building, who read the Buffalo News. And we want to make sure that folks are getting accurate information and that we're representing all the cultures of Western New York properly in our work. So we were very, very lucky and fortunate um, to find our next guest um, to help us with this program. Uh, and it's really made the book itself much better. And someday when we can get together in person again, we think it will make the tour uh, that much better. So um, our next guest is Jody Lynn Maracle, who was born and raised in what is currently considered Buffalo, New York. Jody is a 
K. Haka, mother, artist, teacher, and language learner. Jody utilizes Haudenosaunee material, language, and techniques such as hand tanning deer hides and corn husk twining in conversation with soundscapes, projections, video, and performance to interrogate questions of place, power, erasure, story making, and responsibility to the land. Her research as a PhD student at UB focuses on Haudenosaunee material culture, language, and birth practice land and birth practices. Of all her accomplishments, she is most proud to hear her child speak their Mohawk language each day. So please um, join me in welcoming Jody Lynn Miracle. And I'm just going to remind you that if you do have questions as we go on, just put them in the chat and Tia and I will make sure things get answered at the end. So thank you. And Jody, go ahead, please. And so hello and welcome to everybody. My name is Jody I'm Mohawk, uh, born and raised in Buffalo, New York. I currently live in Brantford, Ontario. Um, I teach at the University at Buffalo. I teach Mohawk language and all manner of indigenous studies classes from art, activism, uh, gender studies, media studies. And I also teach at an immersion school up here, um, teaching uh, all in the language in Mohawk um, based in our culture. And um, I have long, uh, uh, growing up in Buffalo, New York, I've had a very particular relationship to City Hall, to downtown, to the surrounding landscape. Um, and I'm glad that I was able to um, come on this project to help flesh some of those things out. Um, and I kind of wanted to situate not just City Hall, but Buffalo broadly, Western New York broadly. Um, with kind of, I guess, a crash course in all things Haudenosaunee 101 before we kind of go any further, because, you know, complicating our relationship to place isn't just about two city hall, it's about um, kind of the entire landscape, the area that I'm guessing all of the attendees or people listening on YouTube who, are, who might watch later either live in or have an affinity for or visit or have some kind of relationship with Western New York. Um, let me just, there we go. So it's like a way back kind of map. This is very broadly where the original five nations of the six nations that comprise the Haudenosaunee Confederacy lived. Um, but to just put it in context for you, here's Buffalo, and this is where all our territories are now. Um, and within two hours of Buffalo, you can get to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of our main territories. You can get to all of our territories within, you know, a six and a half to eight hour drive, depending on traffic. So Buffalo is currently in the heartlands of Haudenosaunee homelands. Um, where Buffalo is specifically is where the Buffalo Creek Reservation was, um, which was formed after um, a pretty violent campaign put on by George Washington from members from many different nations, particularly Seneca. So um, Buffalo is situated, um, you know, in lands that are the responsibility of the Seneca nation. Um, and also close by, you'll notice, is Tuscarora um, with the three Seneca um, territories not far from there. Um, I like to go through and kind of explain a bit kind of ground level if we're talking about relationship to place, we need to understand the people's whose responsibility it is to care for that place. Um, and this is a symbol that some people in Western New York are familiar with. It's very, it's, it's kind of the national flag, if you will, of many Haudenosaunee nations, but it is, you know, you see it on bumper stickers, hoodies, you know, flags waving everywhere, people's home. Um, but this is what's known as the Hiawatha wampum belt. Um, and this, you know, wampum for us, is, it was never money. It's uh, kind of our original treaties. They work as mnemonic devices to commemorate important events. And this important event was the coming together of the original five nations. So Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca. Um, which, you know, the being our physicians, Mohawks are keepers of the Eastern door and 
Senecas are keepers of the Western door. Uh, this is another image that people will see throughout Western New York. This tells the story of when the Tuscarora were brought in as the sixth nation of the uh, Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And you can see the six bands there indicating the six nations um, as we made room in our metaphorical longhouse for them to, to join the Confederacy. Another image that I'm sure people have seen throughout Western New York, especially if you frequent either of the Seneca casinos in Niagara Falls or downtown Buffalo. Uh, this is the flag of the Seneca Nation of Indians um, who's, um, who have responsibility to care for a uh, land throughout Western New York. And it has their three main territories of Cattaraugus, Oil Springs and Allegheny, but it's important also to acknowledge the territories that are in Niagara Falls and downtown Buffalo as those are reclaimed land. Um, and here you'll see their clan animals. They have eight clan animals and we'll talk a bit more about those as they pertain to the architecture of City Hall in a little bit. Um, and a note about you know, why they're called Seneca Nation of Indians is because much like when Buffalo Creek was formed, when their territories were formed, they had citizens of many nations living there um, and seeking refuge. So it wasn't just Seneca people, it was citizens from many indigenous and Haudenosaunee nations. It's also important to acknowledge when people think about important events or even treaties or things that resemble treaties, they think this is something that happened only between indigenous nations and European newcomers. Um, but we had agreements uh, between, or between indigenous nations and communities all across Turtle Island, all across North and South America. Um, and this one uh, indicates not just a responsibility to current peoples alive, but to future and past generations. In Mohawk, it's called Sewadokwatsara. It's also known as the dish with one spoon belt. Um, and this is a responsibility to all of the resources that are in the Great Lakes watershed. So the St. Lawrence Seaway area over to the shores of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, and beyond that um, in cooperation. And so I like to include this when I begin presentations because um, you know, as a reminder that we had uh, very, very rich political social structures already in place that were designed to caretake for many generations, as well as the resources that we all had to share, because I think that sometimes gets obfuscated when we talk about Indigenous anything, is that somehow our history began when all these Europeans showed up and suddenly we're in the written record, right? Um, and this is another very important one, especially given today's topic. Um, in English, it's known as the Turo Wampum Belt. And this was originally um, between Mohawks um, and broadly Haudenosaunee nations and the Dutch, but it is between um, you know, the US, between um, many European newcomers who came and Haudenosaunee nations, wherein um, you'll see these three white lines here. Um, that we are to live in um, friendship slash brotherhood um, in peace and with a good mind. And, um, you know, people were who were in the boat, so to speak. So people of European descent, Americans, European newcomers are to stay and travel their path. And we can be in our canoe in this path, but we are not to disturb one another. The point here is that those two don't meet, that we aren't to interfere with one another's um, social realities, cultural realities um, in, a, in a spirit of mutual understanding and respect. Um, so, you know, these are kind of the big things that people might see out and about in Western New York and to kind of just set that, set that tone for really when we think about place, a place doesn't become a place because a building is built on it. A place is a place because humans have a relationship to it. And that has been, you know, where Buffalo is has long um, been a place of, of human meeting and greeting and, and um, support. Um, and so a little bit about kind of, you know, what I wanted to address today. Um, you know, I think Christy did a good job of kind of highlighting some of what PBN really 
uh, came to acknowledge in reworking their book and reworking um, their tour was that there was not only, um, you know, politically correct errors, right? Like what term do we use? Are we being sensitive? Like, but really there were basic factual errors that were peppered throughout. So I will be talking about some specific kind of factual things pertaining to City Hall, um, but also we really need to acknowledge is how did these things, um, these, how did so much indigenous imagery and language and appropriation of, of these important motifs from many different cultures become so normalized? How, why was it so important to include all of this? What was, you could build a whole, I mean, look at the Chrysler building. They were like a car, boom, beautiful, right? It has a lot of the same Art Deco motifs. So why is indigenous everything peppered and appropriated throughout all of City Hall? Um, we can't really extract um, the idea of, we can't say that simply, well, they liked it, right? There's an entire power structure that goes along with it. Like, yeah, the designs look good, but why put forth so much time and effort into that um, and into really centering indigenous imagery and motifs throughout. And I wanted to focus on, um, this, is the, this is from that same chunk that um, Christy had shown. I think she said that it faces Elmwood. And after, forgive me, I haven't been able to go to City Hall for quite some time. I actually used to go on the tours regularly, but if I, you know, feel free in the chat to correct me, uh, PBN folks, if I misspeak as to where these things are located. But I wanted to start with kind of, this is, you know, that image that Christy showed where red jackets in the middle. This is the leftmost portion of that if you're looking at it. And what you see here is really a very standard kind of representation of how indigenous and settler relations are talked about in America well into today, right? So you have this very Davy Crockett looking kind of fellow and he is clearly building a very sturdy Lincoln log cabin over here. And he has his, you know, very manly ax and he seems to be very, you know, rugged and pioneer spirit and can do know how. And then you have um, three native men. I'm going to presume they're Haudenosaunee because of where things are, but what's, important to note is that they are bringing him things, right? He's standing there with his hand outstretched. They're bringing him supplies. And I want to highlight this piece because, you know, if you think about the Thanksgiving myth, if you think about the way that these things are talked about or taught in school, there's no conflict, right? There's simply a contact and then suddenly America becomes, and America keeps becoming, and it keeps growing, right? And we call this progress. We call this civilizing. Suddenly there's um, people here who know how to use the land and doing a lot of air quotes because I think it just saves some wordiness on my part. Um, but it's important to note that, you know, as much as Christy, she really highlighted that there in the Art Deco movement, there was not just nods, but a very self-conscious use of indigenous motifs from not just North America or local indigenous nations, but from throughout the Americas. And a big part of that is America has heavily relied on identifying with this, this fabricated idea of what an Indian is. You know, when I say the word Indian, I don't mean people, I don't mean actual communities. America has always had an idea of the Indian. And so America has really latched onto that to make this idea of this, of this warrior spirit their own. And, you know, you can think of even like the Boston Tea Party. Why did they have to dress up as native people and call themselves Mohawks, right? Like we see it time and time and time again. But one of the big problems with this, it's not simply like that's inappropriate. Like, you know, we don't do that anymore. Um, a big problem with this is that we have so much of these stories told over and over and over again that not only are these historical inaccuracies, but they really influence our day-to-day -day lives or relationships with living indigenous people and nations and communities. And I also picked this image because down here, these little pointy parts here with this, um, with this piece in the middle, 
this is a very common motif in Haudenosaunee design. We see this a lot on our pottery. We see it a lot in our beadwork um, where we have, you know, from our very first kind of uh, material, our oldest existing material culture where we have this up and down pattern. But for us, that has a very specific story and specific um, and specific kind of cultural message behind it. Um, so it's also interesting when you have people from different backgrounds engaging with the same building, what story is being told, right? I often think, you know, I've been on the tours as a Mohawk person, if there are native kids on the tours, what is their response to those things when, when they see these images or when things are misrepresented or that's not what they heard growing up, right? And it's important to consider too, before we get into the specific pieces, um, you know, of what is the entire story of City Hall? City Hall is not simply a beautiful bunch of design. There's a definite message being told. Um, as I'll explain later, a lot of the Haudenosaunee specific um, language and design is around the base. And so much of this like indigenous imagery forms kind of the ground level. And then from there, as you move up, you have this idea, you know, you don't see as much of the indigenous imagery and you start to have this narrative of what is considered progress, right? You know, City Hall really, you know, glorifies industrialization and capitalism and um, this very kind of um, hardworking, hardworking pioneer spirit, if you will. But I believe this is on the West, if that's correct. It's, well, you can't miss it if you turn around enough times and you walk in City Hall. So <laughs> it's pretty big. Um, but there's already, I think, kind of the story that City Hall tells being laid out that isn't complicated when you go on these tours, that is maybe not complicated or interrogated when people enter the building or look at literature. Um, you have um, a pretty clear divide of, of you know, where are the black and brown people in this image and then where are the, you know, white people in this image with the, you know, this kind of we see these figures throughout, but this kind of um, godlike image in the center. And what you'll see here is there's um, a native person, and I hesitate to call them Haudenosaunee or Seneca or subscribe a nation to them because we don't really know. And it doesn't really matter in the narrative that City Hall tells, that the designers were telling, the artists were telling. What you have is an indigenous person bringing an offering of cattails to this very godlike image in the middle. And, you know, I'm not sure why the designers chose to use cattails, but I know for us, cattails are what we use to make particular medicines, to make particular mats that are important in ceremony or were used in times of war. I don't know if they knew that or not. Um, but again, you have this normalization as though indigenous people will just slip away because here comes progress. Um, here comes kind of the inevitable idea of industrialization. Um, I think Christy showed this image as well, um, but when we look at this, um, this is one that is described, uh, I think it was in the old book as the headdress, right? And okay, there's feathers and lots of people wear feathers in their hair, like I'll give you that, right? But we can't really make any leaps beyond that. But what we do see is this, all of this design work is very much from nations that are located in the Southwestern um, US. So a lot of this, um, You'll see in rug designs and blanket designs and different sandwork and pottery designs. Um, but what is interesting to me is all these, I guess I don't have to turn my head, all these little loopy loops um, that we have here. This is a very common Haudenosaunee design motif. Um, and we do have stories attached to it. But again, I'm left asking myself, why are we including so much from so many different geographic areas? why is all of this being collapsed into one idea of some pan-Indian mythical culture, right? Even when people say European culture, you know, people know that there are many different nations and cultures within that, but we are not afforded the same kind of liberty within that. 
And I keep coming back to, it's not simply the use of these designs, but where are they positioned? Like what effect are they having? You know, these are the images that are welcoming people in. There's almost, you know, much like we saw in this image, like this welcoming, this offering, this presenting, this graciousness, these images and where they're positioned serve a lot of the same, um, the same message within their structure and where they're positioned and according to what. When you walk in, you're surrounded, you're bombarded by many different nations, imagery, um, social political histories, um, religious motifs um, that are inappropriate to have in public places like this, but they are still serving to welcome anybody who enters Buffalo. They are still serving the same purpose of here we are and we welcome you and there was never any grief, right? So it's important that we don't decontextualize just one image. We need to remember where it is within the building. What is it its effect within the building? What is it next to? Um, because it's very easy to like pick apart one image, um, but it's a whole different thing when we think about it as an experience, as a human being in a physical space experiencing these things. Um, and, you know, I needed to touch on this because this is kind of infamous parts of, um, and sorry, I keep looking over here. This is where everybody's faces are um, on my screen, but um, I think this is, I just got this from the Buffalo News from an article from a photo set that was published February 24th, 2021. Um, but the swastika um, has come up on tours, people address it. And I think rightfully so, this is built, you know, before the whirling log image um, kind of garnered such a um, bad reputation. And yes, it is something that's used or similar images are used across many cultures. But this was a very particularly important um, religious symbol to some of the nations in the Southwest US, including the Hopi, Apache, and Navajo nations. And after, um, later in the 1940s, the Hopi, Apache, and Navajo nations, you know, decided of their own volition, they were never going to use one of their most sacred images ever again because of what, because it had been desecrated um, by the Nazis. But even before that, why, we need to keep coming back to the why. Why were the architects taking one of the most important religious symbols to these nations, to these cultures? Why did they feel that it was okay to do that? Why did they take it upon themselves to do that? Um, and here, this is also very similar design motifs to those nations in what is now the Southwestern United States. Um, and I keep, you know, coming back to the why because, you know, part of having a conversation about moving forward isn't just doing a few edits in a book or writing a new script for a tour. It's really understanding the ethics of power that were in play when this was constructed and that exists today. Um, you know, it's one, I think we grant a lot of gracious courtesy to people of the past because that's how they were. They didn't know any better. People were really racist back then. But these, these telephone games that Christy alluded to from hobby historians, from people who came up with their own idea about what it meant and told somebody else, it does have a direct lasting impact and it snowballs away from people and, and it lends itself to silencing the voices of indigenous people and nations and communities who are not only neighbors to Buffalo, but who live in Buffalo, right? Who work in Buffalo, who visit these places. Um, so, and then this down here is just one of them that um, had been removed, so. Um, so this is some, some of the specifics that I wanted to touch on. It's a little bit, you know, crash course Haudenosaunee things and a little bit um, specific corrections that were made. Um, but this is one of the images. Um, so if you're, before you enter the building, and a lot of times they're shoved away, but you can actually pull the doors out. Sometimes the staff will yell at you if you do it, but if you're inclined, you can pull the doors out around the revolving doors around the back side of the building, um, along the entrances. And they have the clan animals with the names in Seneca and some in Mohawk, and I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, but the clan animals were done in reverence 
maybe reverence is the wrong word, but um, to honor not just um, you know the history, but the clan system is the political and social formation for Haudenosaunee nations. So it's not simply mythology. It's not. It does have a pseudo religious role, but it is a political and social structure um, that um, you know lends itself to easy misinterpretation. It's easy to mythologize something um, if you don't ask anyone about it, right? Um, it's easy to say, boy, those Seneca really love animals and just move on because you never bothered to ask a Seneca person or a Haudenosaunee person. Um, and I wanted to point out that some of the words are in Seneca, but some of them are in Mohawk. And I talked to a few um, speakers of Seneca and also of Mohawk and a few Haudenosaunee historians. And one of the kind of running theories is that when the building was built, they felt no need to distinguish between these six nations. These nations are six distinct languages that have differences, but are common enough that we can understand one another. Um, but when the people um, who were putting together this, this aspect of it, they didn't feel the need to take that extra step, right? They got some Indian words and that was good enough and we'll just slap it on there. Um, this is from, Oh, I don't do that. Okay, sorry, it popped up on my <laughs> This is from um, a contemporary news article from, I believe, just before it was um, kind of open, they were going around really checking it out. This is one of the doors that you can see shut, but again, it's the really, feel free to walk by because you can still pull them out, but they're generally left shoved open. And this is another one of the clan animals, Okwadi, which is a bear. But what I wanted to draw everyone's attention to is down here, even at the time, they had the specificity to say family clans, which is accurate, but then they say the Iroquois tribe of Indians, which is not true at all. It's, you know, these are from specific nations. This is a confederacy of nation. Um, and at the time, the, the different Haudenosaunee nations, particularly the Seneca, still had a lot of of clout, a lot of power um, because of their land holdings at the time. Um, you can see here, this is from 1930. Um, and down here again, it's um, misrepresented as Iroquois Indian tribe. Um, and not all of these, oh, these are just from the doors. So what you can see here is these are the ones from the doors that are in fact clan animals. Um, so you have, turtle, bear, wolf, deer, um, sand, sandpiper. Um, this is a heron, beaver, and hawk. Um, however, by February 24th, 2021, these, all these different animals, which not all of these are on doors, there's a series of carvings, both if you go in the back, before you go up those little stairs, there's different carvings that have Seneca names inside as well as outside the building, kind of like up in the door, you can't see my arms, up in the door like here. Um, but I'm highlighting this write up down here um, from February 24th because it's still committing the same kind of rhetorical violence. It's still erasing a very present reality. It's still erasing um, something that you can Google also. Like the internet exists now. There, You can look up like, what are the things, right? Like, what are the Seneca clans? Like, you don't have to do as much labor anymore. Um, but you can see some of these other image, these other animals that they have with the Seneca ish names. Um, you know, there's snake, there's um, a squirrel, there's an owl here, you have um, like a lynx or a bobcat. Um, but what I found when I would go on the tours is that even though there was so much specific Haudenosaunee, so much specific Seneca language and imagery and things that were actually done really well, when I would go on the tours, those would never get mentioned. What would get mentioned is like if you are in, like if you go through the lobby that, you know, where there's lots of frogs and then there's like a whole bunch of fit, like they look cool. But I would be on these tours and somebody would stop and say like Native American design motifs. And it's like, okay, fair, Southwest, you know, great. And then they'd be like, and here we have the frog nation, the frog tribe of the Iroquois. And I'm like, there's, there's no, there's no frog 
tribe. It's just a frog. I don't even think that's like an Indian thing you're trying to do. There's just frogs there because they look nice, right? So I, I just, I think that there's a lot that can be done to acknowledge what's already there. But I think sometimes there is almost a, a, a block that people hit where when they don't know, they don't ask. They just come up with something to fill in the gap for themselves. And, and conversations are important. Talking to living people is important. Not relying on biased historical records is so important. Um, you know, in the early 90s, when the last book was written, um, you know, Haudenosaunee scholars, historians, linguists, we were still being shut out from major anthropological and historical conferences. We were still being kept out of publications. We were still being told we can't be experts on our own culture. Um, and even though the 90s wasn't that long ago, you know, it's a very new thing that we're able to finally start meaningfully intervening in correcting these narratives, in, in unplugging these telephone games of misinformation, if you will. Um, I guess I just like this picture. Here's the turtle again, it's very nice. Um, oh, and this is an image um, that I think Tia took of some that sit up in the doorway. So they are really beautiful and love them. Another specific piece that I wanted to address that I, I think has not been uh, interrogated at all, if I remember, so let me slow down. So if I remember correctly, in the 1993 book, it referenced these images of the four winds as being um, Seneca names for the four winds or Native American names for the four winds. Um, but what they actually are, are gibberish names that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow came up with for his poem, Song of Hiawatha, which was published in 1855. And it is still being written about as though these are Seneca figures or as though these are Seneca words. And I also wanna pause here because Hiawatha is one of our most important political and historical figures for Haudenosaunee people. So Henry Wadsworth Longfellow already really missed the mark to say the least in appropriating one of our, one of our most central figures to who we are as a people and wrote this poem, but then to have this strange elision in the construction of this building with Henry Longworth Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's under like fabricated notion of Hiawatha put directly next to something that actually got part of our social political structure right is a very confusing moment when I think about how to analyze when I was preparing for this talk I you know I keep coming back to it really was just that self-appointed authority to say you know we are the exports experts. We are the people who know best and clearly there is no consultation with any indigenous people um, around this construction. And again, this is from February um, 24th, 2021, and I'm going to just read it. Stone carvings representing the four winds can be seen over each entrance. Karibo Naka, I don't know how to say these because they're not real words, or the north wind is over the front entrance, top left, very intimidating. Wabun, or keeper of the eastern door, over the rear entrance, top right, also, I don't know how you can have a translation of something that isn't a real word. Um, Kebion, or keeper of the Western door over the rear entrance and Shawandasi, or the South wind over the front entrance, bottom right to the lobby in Buffalo City Hall. Now, what's interesting here is I have found these, interp or these interpretations elsewhere. I, I believe it was in the original book and I've also seen it written about similarly in you know some architecture blogs and some buffalo news write-ups but there's this authority that appropriating our actual political structure saying you know where i explained earlier mohawks are the keeper of the eastern door senecas are keepers of the western door that's part of our political responsibility with this henry wadsworth longfellow makes people think that they suddenly know something. So then when they encounter the truth, we're stuck defending ourselves or within a classroom setting or a university setting or to talk. It really does do so much work to give people the sense of being the authority without any of the interrog interrogation process attached to it. 
Um, but at the same time, these are very beautiful. I'm not like, I want to like carve these out or something like they're absolutely gorgeous. It's just, we need to do the reworking of not simply saying these aren't actually Seneca things. They're from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, but really taking it a step beyond that, really wondering why did Wadsworth even do that? Why do we suddenly now translate these things this way? Um, because there was a folding in of our real cultural realities with a fabricated idea of what all of these things meant. Um, and Christy showed the image uh, that this is from, um, you know, this very uh, generous understanding of history. But if you walk up to the observation deck, here's Red Jacket. Uh, I'm glad he's there. He's pretty important. But it's also, what is the story that's being told, right? Most people don't know who that guy is with 1810, like shaking some white dude's hand, right? Like most people don't even look at that, that, I don't know, it's a, there's probably an architecture word for it. I don't know. The really cool stone carving. Um, but um and to suddenly be confronted with this on your way up the stairs is a very strange moment. It's almost like this little like nod, but the text of it is, did you know Red Jacket, the famous Seneca diplomat and orator led a delegation to Washington in 1810 to keep bright the chain of friendship. And that's actually a nod to the Tura Wampum. That can be a whole other talk if we want to do it. Between the six nations and the United States, Red Jacket was from, drum roll, Buffalo. But he wasn't. He wasn't from Buffalo at all. He lived there for a little bit. He was born somewhere totally different. He lived in a totally different reservation. And then Buffalo was like, oh man, he did so much good stuff for the US. We should claim him. He's ours now. Guys, write it down. And Buffalo went so far, his dying wish was don't dig up my body. Leave me buried in my home community. And what did Buffalo do? All of these nice white ladies started like petitioning dug up Red Jacket's body to bury him in Forest Lawn. And so I keep coming back to why do we need to keep claiming things that are not buffaloes to claim, right? Even this final moment on your way to get a beautiful view of the beautiful city and you're stuck with owning someone who is a living, breathing purpose that was not buffaloes to own. You can't, you know, claim, you can't erase somebody's entire history, which you can also read on Wikipedia. That is also problematic um, to suddenly just be like, we found a good Indian. He's ours guys, hands off, right? And I did wanna say too, the story of it being a tomahawk, um, for Haudenosaunee people, you'll notice this little nub here, if you, if you all wanna get weirdly close to the screen like I'm doing, um, you'll notice this little nub here. For us, the peace pipe and the tomahawk are the exact same tool. And symbolically and also in practice, what it meant was that you always have a choice in any interaction with a nation, with a community, with a person, with people who are coming into your village or your territory, you have a choice. It's the same set of tools, metaphorically being yourself, your body, your mind, um, but you have a choice. Are you, are you going to smoke with them? Or are you going to defend yourselves in your community and your family against potential harm? And um, I believe that this actual piece, um, despite NAGPRA being around for like Native American Graves and Repatriation Act being around for like ever at this point, um, it took a long time, but this has finally been returned. And that was a huge moment. And it was a lot of work. It was decades of work to get that back um, um, to Seneca people. but. You know, this is this is another piece of you can look at centuries of historical record that'll say red jacket, buffalo, tomahawk, but that still is not the case because you're missing the living, breathing component of people who are not only members of this of this living, breathing culture, but who are also experts in these fields who have put in just as much work as if not more any any white historian, any white anthropologist. Um, and I'm going to go to the next slide because I don't think that I have a nice, neat little cherry to put on that Sunday. So what now? So I told you like all these things that City Hall is just like, what are you doing City Hall, right? Like I still love it as a place. I still like to visit it. I still like to think about what is this structure telling Buffalo? What is this structure telling people who visit it? Why, why does it still draw so many people in? 
you know, I think there's kind of the obvious steps that PBN in particular started taking, right? So rewriting the book that needed a lot of help talking to actual living, breathing um, Haudenosaunee people, um, you know, working on these tours. Um, something that we had kicked around is what if actual Haudenosaunee people did these tours sometimes, right? Um, you know, what, what an experience that would be. Um, but I think that each person, you know, I imagine that a lot of people who are drawn to this, to this talk, to this session, um, do have an interest in history, do already kind of think a little bit about where they are and the stories of the place that they're at in ways that other people don't. And sometimes it's about taking it a step further. What do I believe about this place? Why do I believe it? Where did I hear that from? Right? Sometimes it's that extra little internal push, right? Because it isn't all doom and gloom and like, you know, just everybody needs to give the lamb back. I mean, that'd be great, but we know that's not happening. Um, but it is about what does an equitable relationship look like of, of what does giving up that self-appointed authority look like? What does admitting you actually have no idea why you've been saying something for so long other than you learned it in the fourth grade in social studies in New York State? That like one time you built a popsicle stick longhouse, right? Um, so I think that, you know, if I wanted people to take away anything, it's that this is, you know, about a power structure. It's not just historical error errors in one building, it is about a power structure that is going on well into today. Um, you know, that was made up of a lot of small and large steps, but that will take a lot of small and large steps to undo from individuals and from communities and organizations. So um, that's all I had to say. I'm sure I missed something in there, um, but yeah. Thank you so much. I so appreciate that. And um, we do have a couple of questions and um, anyone um, else, if you're thinking of them or you have them, like throw them in. It's only 7.15. So we definitely have some time for some questions. Um, I think that you'll agree we lived up to the title of this presentation anyways. I do hope that you've found, if nothing else, we've um, complicated your relationship to one of our favorite places. And you know, we, we wanted to do that. We warned you in the title that that would happen. Um, so you know, if you're like me, you'll probably spend a lot of time thinking about this and um, thinking about what now, what next. I did want to, before we go to the questions, um, you know, we, I think, um, as I started to say before, you know, part of um, being, I think, responsible when you're in the civic uh, realm is acknowledging um, things that you maybe don't know um, or that you could do better. And so we hope that you appreciate that um, spirit of vulnerability that we brought to the table um, here today. This is part of PBN's journey. And just um, uh, continuing on that, uh, one of the things that we um, uh, are working on is a new strategic plan for the organization. And part of what we're including in that is actually working on a land acknowledgement um, uh, 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 statement that we can include in PBN's work. And I just wanted to um, uh, just, again, part of what I wanted to do in this is just also give permission for other folks to be vulnerable in their own organizations, in their own work. We all have this complicated relationship to place. Um, and you know, PBN's mission, um, part of it is connecting people to the places they love. And we know that we all love um, so many aspects of this community. And I think um, deepening our relationship with it is, is a part of that, is a part of responsibly loving a place. So we're excited about this. But I asked Jody, um, in sort of the beginning of our relationship, I was like, hey, Jody, can you write a land acknowledgement statement for us? She was like, uh, no. <laughs> um, that's something that PBN has to do. She was like, what do you, why do you want an acknowledgement statement? What are you acknowledging? What does that have to do with your work? How do you hope that guides your relationship to place? And really complicated that um, for us. And so, um, you know, we're taking that that input seriously and, and we'll be putting out more on that um, over the coming time. But we have a lot of next steps in our work. And so we just encourage folks, um, you know, who live in this community to really think seriously about all of this. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions, Jody. Um, if you don't mind, I think this first one I'm gonna direct to you. Um, Jackie wants to know, 
uh, were you suggesting that the religious symbol, the swastika, diminishes the legacy of indigenous people? I'm not sure how we should look at this symbol, she says. So I just wanted to know if you wanted to just uh, clarify what you were saying um, in terms of the swastika symbol. You're the, um, yeah. the Spanish. So I think that a lot of times like when you get to that point in the tour or a lot of buildings feature from this era, the swastika, what we now call the swastika symbol. And people look at it as being problematic only because of the way that it was used by Nazis, right? That it became a symbol affiliated with them. But what I'm saying is that it was problematic that in the first place, a bunch of people who are not of that culture thought that it was okay to take one of the most important sacred symbols for these people and just put it in some buildings because it looked cool. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I won't draw analogies because that's not, I think, helpful, but we really need to consider even before it was problematic because of what happened with the Nazis, we really need to consider the problematics of a bunch of people taking a sacred symbol and using it very haphazardly to be generous. Thanks, Jody. I appreciate that answer. Um, I was really moved by the fact, which one of the things I learned on this was that um, some folks decided to give up their own symbology that was important to them because it had been so corrupted. Um, and as someone who has family who was affected by the Holocaust, I, I found that incredibly moving um, and, and a sign of sort of human solidarity in some way. So I guess we all take uh, different things out of you know these, these pieces, but... Um, uh, I think this next one is for Christy. I think we have two actually for Christy. Um, is there any record of the architects researching any of the artwork by asking local indigenous people? Is there any kind of um, uh, work that, that we've ever found? Or maybe Jody, you've done a little bit on this too. I don't know, but um, I know Christy did a lot of work on um, kind of the architects and the designers. And then related to that, um, someone was asking who designed all the artwork in City Hall, surely not just listed architects. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the artists, um, you know, who are involved. And there is more information on the artists in the book, just FYI. And we know the book is late. And we apologize for that, but you will get that soon. Um, so the first question about did the original designers reach out and research or and talk to Indigenous people or anything like that? And no, we don't have any evidence <laughs> that they actually asked an indigenous person or anyone with firsthand knowledge of these these um, elements uh, and, and, and figures and symbols. Um, what we do have um, is uh, a couple of articles from that time period where the head architect uh, Wade uh, did speak about the design motifs and, and elements that were being included in it. And in all of those articles and the few mentions where he actually does talk about it being derived from Indian designs, it is simply that. It is left at very vague, you know, how Jody, every time I, Jody talk, every time I listen to Jody, I learn more and more things. And this, I've literally wrote down two pages worth of notes so far um, that it was just this, it emphasized how Jody explained it, this creation of pan Indian elements. Um, there's one article uh, that I just, uh, I, I would share on the screen, but it's very blurry. It's not a good copy. So it's not going to be enjoyable for you guys to look at. Um, but it's an article that literally says the Indian motif. And how does he describe the Indian motif? It's filled with reds, greens, and soft browns. That's how he knew it was an Indian motif. Um, so we have that documentation, uh, but there is no record that he there was an actual speaking to anyone. Um, and then to the, who are the actual designers, um, John, oh, John J. Wade, the head architect, uh, you know, we have architectural drawings that show that he and his partner architects on the project really were the ones who designed many of the sculptures and elements in there. Uh, whether the exact details of what those carvings should look like, but at least the sketch of what it should be reflected in that piece. And then those sketches and architectural drawings were then made into real life by a whole team of sculptors that worked under them. Um, the really the only named um, designer other than the architects who worked on the interior and exterior sculpture was Albert T. Stewart. Um, but primarily the things that he worked on 
were the non-Indigenous inspired elements, or at least the lesser inspired by Indigenous motifs. So the main frieze on both sides of the building, he was responsible for those figures and some of the other elements on the exterior and, and interior, the, the figureheads that are in the, the rib vaults of the, city, of the lobby, and as well the figures that are in the Common Council chambers, those 12 columns that line that room, he designed those figures. But again, I I think the majority of these pan Indian elements were from Wade himself or the team of unnamed designers. <laughs> um, Christy, while I have you, and then I think the next question probably will go to Jody, but um, Christy, while you're on, um, is the appropriation of indigenous, is the appropriation of indigenous art and culture common in other art deco buildings? Is that something we see commonly across our, the art deco style? Oh yeah, definitely. Like as I showed the some a few examples in the beginning of the, the presentation, it is very much part of Art Deco examples in America to borrow from not just, you know, the indigenous um, people that lived in their community, but just this from anywhere in the Americas, as Jody described. Um, so the examples we saw in the more in the earlier, there is sort of an emphasis on, you know. Mesoamerican influences and that idea of Mayan uh, cultures, because again, that kind of racist simplization and simplifying of cultures that these Mesoamerican communities built these grand structures. So they obviously were somewhere close on the way to being as civilized as us. So we'll pull from their elements, but maybe not, you know, so maybe choosing Mayan is happens more often because of that. But yeah, there are many, many examples across America of this, you know, just incorporation of these, you know, summarized versions of actual indigenous designs. <laughs> very, very common. And related to that, Jody, I want to ask this question to you um, uh, from Marianne. Uh, circa 1910, there was a concern among progressive anthropologists that native culture was being erased by whites. Any evidence that the architect believed that believed this? I'm sort of curious what your take on that question um, is, and do you want to speak for white ar <laughs> anthropologists at the <laughs> beginning? Of the last I time? would love a chance to speak for white architects or architects anthropologists. They've been doing it long enough for us. Um, you know, I'll speak. I can't speak to what the architect believed. And I think this touches a bit on some things that we've been swimming around, but, you know, since it, since like, I think civil war era, there was an obsession that native people were going to go extinct. Like that's why William Soule started doing the photographs. That's why Edward Curtis started doing the photographs. That's why Edison first, his first movies were of native people. Um, but they, it wasn't just a physical extinction. You have to remember scientific racism, social Darwinism, these were big ideas around this time that were informing everybody. So this idea was that native people, if we, we would be somehow not of our own cultures if we wore vests. Did you know Geronimo had a car that he loved to drive around? You know, if we listened to radios, all of these things were edited from the historical record. Edward Curtis would, you know, dodge and burn all of these modern things out of his photos because he wanted to preserve the authentic Indian. Um, so, and it's also important to remember that 1910 sounds far from the Civil War, but that entire post-Civil War, well into the early 1900s was the Indian Wars. And it was outright onslaught after onslaught after onslaught. And this is also when during the same time period where people were worried we were disappearing, our children were being stolen from our homes. And this was policy into the 60s. Our children, you know, not just had their hair cut, but they wouldn't go home for 18 years. They were trained as farm laborers. They were used for medical experimentation. So it was always when people say they were concerned that we were disappearing or our culture was being erased by white culture, one doesn't give it any credence to the fact that that policy was in place to make that happen. But two, just like the erasing of the whirling logs from these cultures, why is every other culture allowed to evolve and adopt new things? Like a tradition it only has to be done twice before it's a tradition, right? You know, like we didn't always have seed beads 
Like there's no seed bead bush in the woods. Um, and I say all that just because, you know, whether it's 1910 or now, um, a lot of the argument for, for using our design motifs or our motifs in fashion today, or even mascots, a big argument we hear is we're preserving culture. We're, we're saving for education, but you know, what's, what are the things that are happening in the background? And so to, you know, I would absolutely say that if the architect didn't believe it, that he, there's no way he wasn't influenced by the entire American understanding of its relationship to indigenous people. There's no way he came out of it without that kind of in, information in his back pocket. Sorry, I'm so long-winded. I'll just, maybe I'll try to answer something direct. I always say about myself, like why answer a question in five words when you could use 50, you know? So we love that around here. Um, I think that's your answer really, um, you know, there was another, a similar question um, to is the, was the choice of an Indian, an Indian theme for City Hall linked to ethnographic interest in Buffalo dating to the Pan American Indian Congress? And based on your answer and what Christy has told us, I'm going to go ahead and say, as you said, you know, there clearly this was a conversation in the zeitgeist at the time. And these were things that were happening and that we we're talking about. And so um, it wouldn't be surprising that the architects and the anthropologists and those folks were engaged in and influenced by that conversation. And Christy wants to jump in. Yeah, just to emphasize something that uh, none of us have said, but uh, further like amplifies things that Jody has said is that, um, you know, City Hall is about celebrating Buffalo in this progress and that it's, uh, again, how Jody explained it in the beginning, how all the native, all the indigenous imagery is at the bottom, welcoming you in and then allowing you to get to the top where the actual important things are and where culture and government are. And I think that it's also important to understand the the, that that's literally why they built City Hall. City Hall was being completed at the centennial. So we had existed for a hundred years. This building was seen as the middle marker in our continued progress. So again, it just even more so emphasizing how we didn't see the indigenous culture for them and on their own right and celebrating it as one of the many you know faces that created this city that we now live in it was seen as the bottom foundation of what we built upon to be this hundred year marker now and then moving forward into the even more civilized futuristic world that we will have um so that was you know that the fact that that's literally the thinking behind that building uh, that we know that thought process <laughs> that was made clear and emphasized by the designers that makes sense. Um, to bring it back to um, the, the building itself, um, Jeff is asking about the polychromatic terracotta tiles on the tower, which were described as a headdress in some of the literature. And um, Jody, do you have any additional insights on how the tower, how in other ways the tower draws on indigenous material cultures that you'd like to share or you think our audience might be interested in? Um, I think that, you know, I think that the way that it's most related to um, broadly indigenous material culture, but I'd argue very much the nations that are located in what is now the Southwestern United States is what it's particularly referencing in these, in the shapes of it, in the color motif, in the materials. It's really evoking just like, you know, with that, um, for lack of a better term, that headdress piece, right? That you look up that centerpiece. Um, but that was done, from my understanding, in homage to a headdress. Um, but the people in the Southwest do not wear headdresses. Little, actually a well-known fact. That's not a little known fact. That's, that's like a thing. They don't wear headdresses. <laughs> so, so I think that, you know, that specific um, element of it is just, again, it's almost comically mind baffling. Like it's almost like the architects went out of their way to just never talk to a native person, like ever. I mean, I think that was one of the questions, but I, I kind of make this like flabbergasted face because it's so much to try and in my scholarly brain or just my human brain get around like the, the why of it. Um, 
so it's, I mean, it's one of those things. It's almost like, you know, I, I teach Indian image on film. So we have to watch Westerns, but it's almost like when I watch like John Ford films, the early ones, and I'm like, guys, it's really bad. This is just a thing they did and don't do it anymore. And that's kind of how I feel about like the tower. I'm like, okay, you want to call it a headdress? We're not knocking the building down. It's a very nice building. You really missed the mark though. So a cacophony of errors. Uh, yes, I want to um, reassure our, <laughs> our membership and our audience that we still love City Hall of PBN. We aren't saying it should be torn down. We just want to develop a fuller understanding of it. And I think understanding its place in history is really interesting um, and cool for those of us who are really interested in history and these conversations. And it's not, you know, we just want to open up this dialogue and really understand because how do we do better? And um, that's a segue into the next question, um, which uh, is, um, it seems that art and architecture have always borrowed from a variety of cultural influences. Do you feel that this is inherently wrong or is it just the misrepresentation and incorrect attributions that are bothersome here? And I do, I mean, obviously that could be a two hour discussion in and of itself and probably longer. And I think we, we talk about that a lot in terms of appropriation of a lot of different cultural things by a lot of groups and and obviously that's a, a long conversation but I don't know Joe did you want to just give a couple sentences on you know what what you think is happening here and what our takeaway should be kind of from that conversation I think I think it's easy to say that there's influences or borrowing but that totally eliminates the power dynamics um, and I tried mm -hmm. to keep coming back mm -hmm. to the reality that you know city hall was built, I think, as um, Christy had said, like much of Buffalo, or maybe Jesse did, someone said it, to serve, you know, like white, wealthy, cis men. This was, this was who the city was designed for. And so to say that, you know, the bothersome aspect isn't necessarily the factual inaccuracies, it's that there's such an ownership over our lives, over our stories, over our political systems, over religious imagery from other nations, that there's no, white people don't have to feel the repercussions of that, you know, and it, it's important to remember that there is that power dynamic in there that needs to be a big part of that conversation if we're going to ask those questions. That's a great answer. And Heather also put in the chat for anyone who's interested, the intellectual property issues and cultural heritage um, is a great place to go and sort of educate yourself, you know, a little bit more about these issues. And definitely one of the things I've taken away from my relationship with Jody is um, how to educate myself a little bit more about these issues before I, um, you know, uh, start uh, uh, start working on that. So that's a great resource. So thanks, Heather, for that. Um, I think we had um, a question, Marsha. Marsha, are you not able to use that chat box? Um, why don't you try throwing that in the chat box? Um, I put it. I put it in the. I put it in the chat box, but I can't get it to you. Well, oh. <laughs> I'm technologic. I'm technologically challenged. I'm 73 years old, and this is all new to me. So, what do I do after I type my comment? Well, you could just hit return, and it should. Send it, it away to us, but returned. or enter on your keyboard enter, and it should yeah. enter or return should work. Hi, Marsha, it's Tia. <laughs> and if not, no. since you're unmuted, we'll make a Marsha exception <laughs> and you can ask your question, Marsha, and we'll take it from there. I'd rather it were read. Um, basically, what I say is cultural appropriation and lying about it has been the modus operandi of the European and his descendants, especially in the Western hemisphere forever. And I think that's another way of uh, paraphrasing Jody's uh, emphasis on the power structure. Well, I but I would like to know how to do this. <laughs> well, John, Tia will so call you every yeah, Marsha, I'll, no, I'll no. set up a Zoom meeting with you and I'll, I'll give you a whole Okay, thanks. No it's one of the many services we offer here at PBN, and she's only doing that for you, Marsha, because she has to do it for me every single day. Yeah, that's so don't not a oh. thing embarrassed, and that's a true story. Um, okay, but I did thanks. want to um, 
<laughs> You're welcome. Just to build on that a little bit more, you know, I mean, uh, I think what Jody said and then what Marsha kind of uh, built on a little bit was, um, uh, you know, I said that um, the city was built to serve um, wealthy white men. I don't know that I believe that. I believe that what we have, the stories we've taken away, the things we've preserved, preserve a lot of that story. Um, you know, the story is so much more rich than that and interesting than that. And when we think about, you know, the growth of the city of Buffalo, just even in European history, all these immigrants who pass through this community, all these women whose stories, you know, are never told um, in the history books, you know, there's, there's, there's so much more to our community. And I think we're all so much richer for knowing this fuller, more complete story of who all of our neighbors are, who all the folks who have passed through our community, um, you know, over thousands and thousands of years are. Um, and so I think, you know, I just, I want to think about it, you know, that way, um, that it may have been um, built in many ways to serve certain folks, but we've all been a part of it and our ancestors have been a part of it. And I think that's, I think we're trying to make sure that we know more of those, um, more of those stories. And I think the stories um, that get most overlooked are, as Jody says, that the, the, the stories of the folks with less power. And so we want to make sure that we're, um, that we are being kind of overtly political in that sense of like exploring those power dynamics. So I really appreciate um, Jody bringing that um, up and else for, you know, sticking with this conversation, which I think is like, uber intellectual for a Monday night <laughs> and uh, the caliber of the questions has been really high um, and I really appreciate uh, appreciate it and I've lost track of the chat so hopefully Tia has been um, can I just say yeah, one thing there's just one uh, hold on Marsha we'll come right back okay, okay. No, it's really it's really important <laughs> okay we'll come right back to you after okay. thank you for this uh, question which is uh, the city hall mural frontiers and unfettered by any frowning fortress features an indigenous man with a stereotypical large feather headdress in a canoe. Is this image an accurate portrayal of, at all? I think canoes at least are indigenous. Yes, we like canoes. <laughs> um, it's, I think one of the things though, that's hard to take away. Like I can't picture that image but like, how bizarre, I just keep coming back to you. They got the clans right. They did some of the language right. They really, you know, red jacket, a lot of work to get him right in stone. And then they just have so many little throwaway, like here's some feathers, here's some canoes, here's like a headdress thing on the ceiling. And like, yeah, that's good. Like, so yeah, cause you maybe can be. Yeah, and, and especially with the, the, with the murals themselves, I think, like I said before, quickly, a lot of the smaller scale sculptures were done just by that in-house team of, of, car, of sculptors and design and people working on the building. You know, Albert Stewart did the major sculptures on the exterior and the figures on the interior. When it comes to those murals, the large ones in the lobby, in the main section of the library, and then on either end of those hallways, the little lunette murals, those were done by a completely different person. Those were done by William DeLeftwich Dodge, who was a very famous um, muralist at the time. And so, you know, we don't even have the time to delve into like his background and education and understanding and how he put those together. So not necessarily, and you know, there are, is scholarship about what was conveyed to him by Wade of what he wanted those murals to convey. And, and obviously they worked on the design together, but the individual elements are definitely, they are very much his murals and very much fitting in his style and the types of motifs and things that he included in them. If you've ever been to the state capitol in Albany, the I think it's the map, the flag room or the map room, it's some object room like that, where he, the entire ceiling is all these different murals and vignettes about something, I don't even remember, I went to their tour God knows how many times in my life and I don't remember what the mural is about, but the style and the imagery, it's so, so exactly similar to what we see in City Hall. And especially with that stereotypical, you know, native person in a canoe with a headdress is in the mural that I find super hysterical, which is the one that's supposed to be talking about the partnership between Canada and America. And even in that, mural there is this air of 
a, there's this power structure that's being shown in that. So even with our white neighbors, we're showing them as being a sub, sub, sort, a subordinate person. You know, they're coming to the border with their goods, which are just raw materials because they can't fathom or handle making them into something, but they give us the raw materials and we in Buffalo and America turn them into good things that America, you know, culture can use. So even in that dynamic that's being portrayed in that mural, it's condescending and, and <laughs> rude as well. Um, so there's multiple layers of awkwardness in especially that mural I find super duper funny. I just want to say though, like, um, that's a really good point about the raw materials that like I like how how ludicrous it is that there's people all over the place in all of City Hall who just don't know what to do. Like, geez, what am I going to do with these cattails or this corn I've been carrying around until you got here? So. Thank God they well, were I think in the mural and handed them to a white man. What would have what would we have done with the corn if we hadn't handed it to that white man? I don't know. We'll never know. We'll never know. Well, I think this is probably maybe a good place to um, sort of bring ourselves um, uh, to an end. I did promise Marsha a last word, so we'll get to Marsha <laughs> and then um, and then we'll we'll close it off for the night. Okay, I really appreciate that. But in true PBN style, my last word might be more than a word. <laughs> uh, but I think that um, from my experience as a docent for many years and many different kinds of um, institutions, I would say that there needs to be some way for those of us who interact with the public to contextualize what it is that we're presenting so that, for those who are totally unaware, so that they can understand that the foundational myths of the United States that uh, relate, the two biggest ones relate to um, us, <laughs> them stealing the land and exterminating the original people. Nobody is going to say that they did that. And the other is that the slave trade uh, built the land that had been stolen from the people who originally inhabited it. And we're not gonna get into all that, but I think that keeping that in mind and somehow diplomatically getting it into our talks or in mention, we can't, we, can't, we can't critique every little aspect. We can't do that. This is wrong, that's wrong, yada, yada. But acknowledge that we, um, that we operate from this, from these two foundational myths, and they are hardwired. They are, <laughs> they're in our DNA. They are there. And as Jody Lynn um, mentioned earlier, as a person of African descent, you know, it's just exhausting. Well, no, that's not quite right. <laughs> Uh, you can't do that. But if you paint the broad stroke that everything about the United States is based on lies, then you have, um, you have a way to contextualize what you're looking at and a way to explain the inconsistencies. All right, I'm off my soapbox. Well, well, Marcia, as always, I so appreciate your comments, and um, I do think this is, um, as we sort of started out saying in the beginning, this is our, you know, our baby steps towards it's getting cool. here, and I think that, I think that you um, are, uh, you know, definitely as one of our docents aware of the work that we're doing, um, you know, to, to try and recontextualize some of these stories, um, you know, again, we want to connect people to the places they love and that doesn't mean all the time whitewashing everything and making it seem perfect our past is complicated our present is very complicated um, and i'm sure it will be that way so for us um, at pbn we want to make sure that we're being intellectually honest and that we're dealing respectfully and responsibly both with history but also um, 
again, um, our Haudenosaunee neighbors are living existing people in our community and so we don't want to be harmful um and and as you say marcia certainly um there are other groups of uh of folks in our community that have been underrepresented in the preservation movement and whose histories have not been accurately told and that's something that we have very a very strong sense of responsibility for as an organization so um you know we're not we're not perfect, um, but uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but we're working towards getting there. And I think you're right to um, think about what are those overall context tools that we could be using on all of our tours is an important piece. So I just wanna thank Jody, especially for, um, for, for doing this with us, for coming on this journey with us. And, um, you know, there is a global pandemic going on, but we have spoken to Jody about the very thing she mentioned in this tour about maybe doing some tours, uh, some special city hall tours that actually center this part of the story, um, in addition to the sort of rewriting um, just the general script. So watch for that. Um, we'll be doing some work um, on that. And um, I just really appreciate uh, everybody's, you know, coming to this event tonight, learning more. We, we think we did complicate your relationship with place, but we hope that makes it deeper and more loving in the end. And again, Jody, thank you so much. And we'll all air clap for you. Um, and uh, have a lovely evening, everybody. Thank you so much.